Hey there, happy artists, and welcome back to Kyle Heath Art. Thanks for joining me today for another art video, and today we're going to look at how to draw a rose. Now, whatever level of drawing that you're at, um, I think it's important to know that drawing is accessible for absolutely anybody. I know some of you may be looking at the reference photo of a flower that I have here and thinking like, oh my gosh, this is way too complex. <laughs> or you may be at a different level. You may be pretty experienced with drawing at this point and uh, pretty much know how to do this. And you might be looking at me for more style guidance or things like that. So I guess, especially for the people who are new to drawing, I want to express to you that drawing is a skill it's a craft that you can get better at, just like anything else. Um, I don't think most artists are blessed with this innate, perfect gift to be just amazing at art. <laughs> I think that just like anything, if you put time into it, you're going to get better at it. And um, certain things that look like magic, if you look at other artists, if you put enough time in, you'll see that it really isn't magic its work. So with drawing, when you're drawing flowers or you're drawing anything else, obviously a flower is an impossibly complex looking subject with all these lines and angles and layers and colors and variations of color. But art is all about simplifying. Drawing especially is a simplification of a very complex subject into something that is manageable, where you're getting at the absolute essence of the thing. And that means that it's possible to draw, even if it's a really complex thing, you can draw it. All it takes is figuring out what really counts in the object and expressing that in your art. So if you look at my progress on this flower so far, you'll see that I'm finding a number of lines in that flower that to me seem to be like the most descriptive, important parts of that object. So I'm not drawing every single thing about the flower. I'm finding the angles. And that's probably the biggest secret I can give you to improving in your drawing is the more you develop an eye for measuring angles, the better your drawing is going to become. And I know for some of you who aren't super experienced with drawing, that may sound very, very boring. But the funny and weird thing about it is it actually becomes really addicting to get into this mental zone where you're measuring angles and creating a drawing that looks accurate compared to something that you're looking at. Drawing puts you in this weird zen-like state, and measuring those angles actually doesn't really become annoying or cumbersome once you get in the state. You actually find that time just <laughs> melts away, and before you know it, even hours can pass, and you have no idea where they went. <laughs> so step one in drawing a really complex subject is to measure the angles of the really important parts. You'll see that how I started with this flower was I found one big overarching shape. And then over time, I'm finding smaller shapes within that and smaller shapes within that. And the more I do that, the more complex the flower is going to look. But if you don't get the big shapes right, then you're not going to get anything right. I think a really common thing to do as a beginning artist is to start full bore with 100% detail. And so for a flower, for instance, you may start at a single petal and um, try and accurately draw every single curve of that petal right the first time. And when you keep doing that, you find at the end of your drawing that your flower is misshapen or it's really wonky looking or the left side is way bigger than the right side or something like that. And that's because you've lost the big picture. The cool thing about art is you can put in as much detail as you want to. And even a piece that is just a big picture that doesn't have all this crazy detail can look absolutely beautiful 
and clearly recognizable as what you're trying to create. So detail is all about jumping in on another stage of the piece, not starting right away with the detail. When I do a drawing, usually I have like three distinct stages of the drawing, and I'm, I'm drawing in stages in, in this flower drawing here. So stage one is getting those big shapes, the big blocky forms that make it look more or less like a flower. And then right now I'm in stage two, which is where I'm starting to carve out those big shapes a little bit and form it into something that's even more recognizable as a flower. And then stage three is the exact same thing. You're just refining further. So right now you'll see that I'm taking the shape of these flower petals and I'm adding different curves to it. I'm making it look a little bit more petal-like. My initial stage of a drawing is usually really sweeping lines and I call it, they're called gestural lines. And the reason I'm doing that is because that brings the big general sense of the flower. It makes sure that I'm still leaning back and looking at the whole thing. It's making sure that my lines have energy, that they look confident. And when I make those gestural lines, I'm using my arm to do them. That's another common error for beginning artists is they only draw with their fingers or their wrist, which is perfectly fine when you're getting into big detail. But when you're drawing the beginning of a drawing, you want to use your whole arm to make some of those lines because that's going to make the drawing look more energetic, confident. It's going to make it more beautiful because a lot of times we see beauty in terms of C curves and S curves. Those big sweeping arches are what really describe things to our eyes and they're the core of how we create beauty. That's one of the reasons why Van Gogh is like everybody's favorite artist. <laughs> it's because when you look at his pieces, there are all these gorgeous swirls and curves. And there's just, even, even if sometimes his work isn't 100% descriptive of the thing he's creating, it's not 100% accurate. He's found the inner beauty of the thing by describing it in C curves and S curves. And the key to doing that is using your arm when you're drawing. Don't just use your fingers. So I'm still in stage two now, and I'm refining stage one of the drawing by making things look a little bit more curvy. I'm adding in special details, and I'm also kind of erasing lines that um, are extraneous or that I may have just used as guides. A good key when you're in stage one of drawing is Make sure you draw very, very lightly. And this is kind of a skill that takes a little bit of time to develop. It's kind of normal to want to just press really hard, but the benefit of keeping a really light hand when you're drawing your first pass is um, you, can, you can then draw over that first pass with darker lines. If you have light lines, they're naturally going to fade right into the background. And you can actually get by with making a drawing without erasing anything if you have a light enough touch. A lot of my personal drawings are done with uh, colored pencils, Prismacolors, and you can't erase those. But that's okay. I, um, they're really waxy and they really respond to pressure well. So I just draw very lightly on the first pass. And um, then on the second or third pass, I'll darken the lines a little bit and everything that I've drawn before just kind of disappears. So that's a good habit to fall into, is your first pass, get a real light touch. You'll see I'm really going in on these shapes now on the second pass, and I'm making darker lines. See that dark line I made? And I'm not erasing the stuff underneath that. I'm just going darker. You'll see that I'm using a, a mechanical pencil <laughs> for the drawing. And um, I know that's kind of uh, low tech in a way, but that's how I like my drawing. A lot of times when I sit down to draw, I'm doing it for fun. I'm doing it to get better at understanding line 
and not so much to understand um, variations in tone. So using a mechanical pencil forces me to think about line 100% because that's just about the only tool I have at my disposal. There are certainly ways that I could blend with a mechanical pencil, um, but using the mechanical pencil as, as a tool kind of encourages me to really think about the line of the subject. And that's usually what I go for when I'm drawing. You'll see as I get into stage three and start doing shading, um, what my specific technique is for, for doing shading. And it's very similar to pen drawing. I, I use like diagonal hatch lines to get the shading in. But I'll dive into that as the drawing gets a little further along. Still in stage two, I'm just looking at each individual petal shape now and I'm making it look more petal-like. I'm being a pretty true to the reference. I'll, I'll look at the reference and then I'll return back to the drawing and try to give at least a good 20 seconds where my eye is just devoted to the drawing. I don't want to ping pong back and forth between the reference picture and the drawing too much because what happens when you do that is a lot of times the the pencil marks suffer. You're kind of thinking about the reference and when you're going to look back at the picture while you're drawing instead of looking at your pencil line and really paying attention to what you're doing there. I'll talk a little bit now about um, the actual anatomy of a flower and, uh, and how to think about it as you're drawing it. Now this isn't a prerequisite to drawing something um, the great thing about drawing is you don't have to have a perfect understanding of the anatomy of a thing to create it. You just have to measure the lines. But it can help to advance, um, once you've advanced, to, to think about the object as like an actual 3D form. And that can help you to really sell the 3D nature of the object. So when you think of a rose, um, it's kind of like an onion in a sense. Uh, it has all these petals that layer over on top of each other. And then when it blooms, the outer layers spread far, far out. And the middle layers, they spread out a pretty good bit. And the inner layers, they spread out just a little bit. And then in the center, you can still kind of see a hint of the uh, rose bud as it used to be before it bloomed. So when you look at the object, you can think of it as layers upon layers upon layers in and of itself. And so it can pay to look at that rosebud in the center and kind of think about the 3D nature of it. Even though you're not drawing the entire rosebud, think of the, um, the rosebud inside and how the petals are kind of wrapping around it, encasing it. It has this beautiful swooping form that goes around the whole thing. And the opportunity to really sell that swooping form comes when you start dealing with the light and with the shadows. And what a perfect time to talk about that because now you'll see I'm adding in my first shadows into this rose. And what you'll see is I'm squinting my eyes and looking at the reference and seeing a shadow shape on a specific petal. And then I draw out that shadow shape with the pencil and then shade it in. And what I'm doing here is the first of three different shading passes. So this is stage three of the drawing and there's three stages to it. <laughs> Hopefully that's not too confusing. I'm gonna go through the entire flower here. And what I'm doing is I'm looking for the absolute darkest darks. I'm looking for the shadows and I'm marking the shape out with that. And so the way I'm thinking of this flower and with any subject is that it's composed of lights, of midtones, and shadows. And that's how I simplify the shading of this piece. So I'll go through in each stage and I'll find um, whatever specific uh, value region that I'm working on at that time. So now I'm going through the shadow region and I'm marking all of those shadows. 
even if this isn't your drawing style, I strongly recommend that you practice this. I can't express enough the importance of having a strong statement of lights, midtones, and shadows. So even if you don't always draw like this, definitely practice this way. This will help you to um, create an object that not only has a strong statement, but also a realistic statement of lights and darks. Light and darks is incredibly complex. The human eye can see hundreds of different fine layers of lights to shadows. And so as an artist who simplifies, you need to find a way to express the reality of this object in a simplified manner. And so this is a great way to start with this and it's a great way to practice with this. Draw out the shape of the darkest shadow you see and then fill that in. And then my next stage following that is going to be to draw the line that divides my lights from my midtones. And I'm not there yet, I'm in shadow world now, but I'll give you a little teaser of what's to come. So in the end, this flower is gonna be composed of shapes that describe the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. And it's something you need to learn to practice too, because um, I don't think any of us like innately, you know, are used to dividing subjects up that way. But this is a great way to train your artist's eye. This is super helpful with painting, and it's super helpful with drawing. Learn to see the lights, the midtones, and the shadows. Whether or not you really love drawing flowers, flowers are an absolutely perfect area for practicing your drawing. And the reason for that is even if you don't get your lines absolutely perfect, it's still gonna look like a believable flower. It's a very forgiving subject to draw. When you're drawing something far more complex, like the human figure or a portrait or something like that, everybody knows, including yourself, when you've done something wrong. <laughs> it's not very forgiving. If you get your left eyeball just a little too low, then You've got a Quasimodo look on your hands. <laughs> and that's perfectly fine. Portraits are great for practice because they're not forgiving, because it's easier for you to see what you did wrong, which means it's easier for you to see how you can get certain things right in your drawing. But if you need some encouragement, or if you just need to work on something that's a little more simple, then flowers or anything in nature is perfect for that. Landscapes in general are like that too. Any shapes that you see in nature, they tend to be um, organic shapes. So whenever you get geometry into play, you're drawing buildings or something like that, um, as soon as the perspective goes off a little bit, you can just tell when it's wrong. But when you're drawing water or stones, grass or trees, these are all organic shapes. And the viewer understands that these could take a million different forms. And, um, you know, it, we wouldn't bat a, a second glance. It, it looks like a rock. It looks like a flower. So these are excellent things to, to draw as a beginning artist. But do challenge yourself too. You want to practice drawing difficult things as much as, um, as much as your encouragement allows because that's where you're going to see where you need to grow. Not that art is all about growth. I think the most important thing about art is the relaxation and the happiness that you get from it. But for those of you who are like me <laughs> and are always trying to get better at stuff, always have goals that you're pursuing, um, go for the hard stuff, you know, find the specific areas where you need to improve and then tackle those. 
but don't forget the, the reason that you got into art at the first place. I think it's really natural and easy for us as artists to, um, I don't know, I guess just get discouraged in our art making. We have all these subtle expectations that we place on ourselves. Like, I wish I sold more paintings, or I wish I painted as good as this person that I follow on Instagram. Or I just don't like myself. <laughs> I just don't feel like I have a style or, you know, all those questions that all of us artists can relate to. Don't forget why you got into art in the first place. The reason you probably got into art is because it made you relaxed or it made you feel happy. You just enjoyed the act of creating something beautiful. I think that's the reason why 99% of us get into art. And um, I think it's good to, to remember that and cling on to that when we start struggling with discouragement or doubts about our direction as an artist. Don't forget the main thing is you're taking part in creating, in making something that expresses your own unique personal view. And that will always be the greatest joy as an art maker, not having fame not getting better, but just being an artist. You'll see here now that I'm marking the line that divides the midtones from the highlights of the flower. And I'm filling in my midtone shapes with lighter diagonal lines compared to the darks. This is my personal style. And um, you could completely fill it in you could fill it in like me and then um, smudge those areas with um, a little smudge tool or with your thumb. It's just a stylistic decision, but the practice of seeing those darks, midtones, and lights is fantastic. And since I'm drawing on white paper, <clears throat> the highlights are already taken care of by the white. In fact, I need to take care that um, I fill in every area that I don't want to stand out as highlight because of the white paper. A neat way to practice seeing these darks, midtones, and lights is to get some halftone paper. And that is one of my favorite tools to draw on, especially when I go to figure drawing. You get this gray or brown midtone paper, and then now you have the mid-tone area covered rather than the light area. So when drawing like that, you'll go in with your pencil or your charcoal, graphite, colored pencil, whatever, and you make your drawing, you mark out the dark shapes, but then you draw in the highlights with white chalk or something that's lighter than the mid-tone. It's, it's probably gonna be white chalk. It creates an amazing lifelike effect. And it's also just a different way of seeing these three value categories, darks, midtones, and lights. I know I sound like a broken record, but breaking down your drawings and your paintings into these graphic elements is critical for, um, for seeing shapes. Painting, the practice is oftentimes about shapes of color. And the magic thing about it is if you get the shapes in the right places, then you've created a piece of art. <laughs> it's absolutely like magic how it works. There's, um, there's an author that I read recently who's really big on that. His name is Charles Hawthorne, and if you're a painter, check him out. He's got a book called On Painting, and his whole shtick <laughs> is about that color shapes thing. Don't worry about what you're drawing. Worry about the shapes. And that's a great thing to think about if you're drawing flowers, too, is you can forget about the flowerness. Think about, like, so this vertical line is a little bit sideways from perfectly vertical and then the line going off it is exactly 90 degrees that's the way you want to be thinking when you're drawing not 
okay, so how do I draw a perfect flower petal? Because a perfect flower petal isn't one shape. It's an infinite number of different shapes. <laughs> and as soon as our brain starts talking to us and saying, oh, I know how to draw a flower petal, well, that's when our drawings start looking like exactly what we drew in kindergarten. It's this inner rhetoric of our brain telling us, yeah, I know how to make that thing. I hope that um, this talk was helpful for you. I hope you learned a little bit more about drawing and some more details on how to draw flowers. I really appreciate you guys. So thankful for you joining me today and uh, hope you have a great day. Happy art making, everyone.